Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for a uh, Joyce artist chat. We have um, with us three artistic directors of the Jose Limon Company, the Trisha Brown Dance Company and Stephen Petronio Company. And we are chatting today about legacy. And um, without further ado, I'm going to ask each of these artistic leaders to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their upcoming virtual season. Um, Carolyn, we can start with you. Hi, um, I'm Carolyn Lucas, um, Associate Artistic Director of the Trisha Brown Dance Company. Um, I've been with the company since 1984 um, and really thrilled to still be um, in relationship to Trisha's work. And this season, we're, um, we just filmed a Locust Trio from 1980 and Water Motor from 1979. And we um, have done a project uh, with the material of Glacial Decoy, and we're calling it the Decoy Project, which I'm really thrilled about. Um, we, uh, we're very interested in transmitting this work to a younger generation. And we um, worked with Lisa Krauss, uh, who transmitted it to our company November, December through Zoom. It was an incredible process. And um, we wanted to invite, um, uh, we wanted to share the work with the community. And so we turned the project from four dancers into eight dancers, and it was just, uh, such an amazing uh, experience. And I think, um, you know, it's really hard to describe what it means to us to come back together in a studio together and work together again after this time period. And uh, I was thinking, you know, everyone was so filled with joy and, and um, but I think it's really special to say, it's like, you feel whole again after this experience to be working in a group. So I think i um, very excited to share this project um, on this season. And we're doing an encore presentation of uh, Geometry of Quiet from 2002 that we performed at the Joyce in 2017. That's great. And um, uh, just a, a little back nugget from uh, COVID shutdown, we were scheduled to have the Trisha Brown's 50th anniversary season in uh, April of 2020. So um, in some way, this is an ongoing, we'll be 50 for a couple of years, just <laughs> so that we can have that, um, that birthday, not birthday, but that celebration, that anniversary, um, but acknowledging that the Trisha Brown Dance Company was 50 years old in the pandemic. <laughs> um, thank you, Carolyn. Um, and Dante, tell us about the Jose Limon Company. You bet. Hi, everyone. I'm Dante Paleo. I am the new artistic director of Limon Dance Company. I was appointed about two weeks after the company, after the world went into lockdown. So I'm coming up on a year anniversary of being appointed. I came into the role in May and then officially in July. Um, so it's been an exciting here, to say the very least. Um, we had an opportunity to go to Katzban to record the season. And it was the first time this season, the, our company had been together since lockdown. It was my first time with the company. Um, and as you can imagine, it was just that moment we're in the studio and people were just like tearing space. They just couldn't wait to move their bodies. Um, and we will be presenting a piece that's really special to me. It was the first piece I learned when I joined the company in 2000. Um, it was the first piece I staged as a reconstructor and it was the first piece I wanted to set on the company. It really reflected what's going on in the world today. Um, these extremes of that we're, you know, that we're living in um, and that's 1956, uh, Jose Limon's There is a Time. Um, in the program, we're also looking at the Mors Pavan and then we're starting off the evening with a piece by Chafe and Seymour called Sweet Donuts. It was a piece that was co-commissioned with ADF um, and that was supposed to premiere last summer, but of course never got its chance. And it's such a beautiful work. There's all these circular patterns and it feels like a contemporary version of theirs at a time. So I wanted to bookend 
the evening that way. And you all have a big anniversary. Um, are you in it or are you about to be in it? Yeah, so this this year, 2021, is our 75th anniversary. Wow. So, you know, we were doing like a little bit of a lead up and like a little bit of a, <laughs> you know, falling, you know, a little rise, a little fall, you know, a little, little limon in there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're in the bulk of it right now. Um, so we're finding all of these, you know, new ways, innovative ways to celebrate. Um, that doesn't require being in front of an audience and performing. So now we're looking at what else it means to celebrate this this moment. Great, and I um, I feel like I heard from Jody Nimerichter at ADF that Chafin was an ADF student. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So there's there's a connection uh, with the American Dance Festival. So mm -hmm. shout out to Jody. <clears throat> um, Stephen, maybe not 50, maybe not 75. Where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> so much younger. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. I'm Stephen Petronio. I'm the artistic director of the Stephen Petronio Company. Um, this is our 37th anniversary. Uh, I believe uh, that we we miss, we were supposed to perform with the Joyce uh, uh, last year, as we do many springs. Uh, spring is usually the time that Stephen Petronio pulls in and uh, stomps on the ground at the Joyce Theater, and <laughs> so. We missed it last year, and it, we were um, we were on the road during the the uh, lockdown, the uh, entry into the lockdown. So um, I hit the ground running um, because I had to say goodbye to my dancers at the airport and at the hotel, and it was heartbreaking. And and uh, and I didn't, you know, no one as many people have these heartbreaking stories. But um, my instinct was to do as much as I could to normalize our activity over over Zoom and then in other ways. And so uh, so this season that we're bringing to you is kind of a journal of our year in, uh, in lockdown. And um, I will uh, tell you that it started, uh, it starts with uh, a film that we made here very early on, uh, sometime in the early spring of last year to Elvis Presley's Are You Lonesome Tonight? And that's with the incredible Lloyd Knight and my own uh, assistant, Nicholas Sassion. And now we have a stage version that we made. Uh, so we're in bubble residencies up here. And I should just go back and say that uh, we have the Petronio Residency Center up in Round Top, New York, not far from where um, Aaron is coming from. And uh, so we've developed a series of bubble residencies, both for my own company and for other companies that, that we could get up here. And, um, and so we have recent, we've done a series of four or five bubble residencies over the course of the pandemic after that first jolt of having to work on Zoom. So we have, a, so we have the film version of Are You Lonesome Tonight? And now we have a stage version of Are You Lonesome Tonight? And, um, and then, uh, Nick Sassione, again, my assistant, is doing a solo that I made for a work that I premiered at the Joyce back in the 90s, and it's to Elvis Presley's Love Me Tender. Uh, it was a collaboration at the time with Cindy Sherman. Uh, so I'm looking at the, um, the older works in my, in my body of work right now as I, as I put them alongside my new works and the works of uh, of other artists that I'm bringing into the company through our Bloods Lines initiative, which is to honor the postmoderns that have uh, moved my life very deeply. So, uh, so we're framing the work against each other uh, and alongside of each other. Um, I've also created something in lockdown called New Prayer for Now. It's not finished, so I'm just letting you know it's a work in progress. I don't, it's gonna take me a few, I mean, I need to get on in front of people for it to be finished, so, um, so it's, um, it's with the Young People's Chorus of New York and Monster Black is doing the score. Uh, it's, it's incredibly moving uh, music, Bridge Over Troubled Water, uh, a version of Bridge Over Troubled Water and um, Bomb and Gilead. We're also, um, we're also doing a series of pandemic portraits that we've taken of the dancers while they're up here, they're short, but we wanted you to hear from the dancers. And then the jewel in the crown is my, uh, this is our seventh year of Bloodlines. And uh, so I, uh, I've asked the Trisha Brown Company for a group primary accumulation. And they were so happy, uh, they were so kind to, to, to uh, lease it to us. And um, it's the first time ever 
that there'll be a male body uh, performing the work. So I'm very excited about that. So, um, you know, these are all, these are all filmed works, of course, and we're getting, we're getting uh, excited about learning how to work with film. So uh, that's really our season and um, I hope you enjoy it. Cool, yeah. Um, so I want to use what you just said about the first uh, male body performing in this work to kind of ask you all a little bit about how you're um, approaching, in what ways that you're approaching legacy and how legacy is both a, a, a respect for and some kind of preservation of the past, a kind of archiving and maintaining the, the essence of the original works, but also the ways that each of you are thinking about how legacy is also about evolution and maintaining relevance for 21st century audiences. So um, Dante, if I could take that over to you first, I know that you're also exploring some gender neutral casting and also some ways to kind of reveal the person behind the company. It's not just the organization that this anniversary is celebrating, it's the creator of the work. So can you talk a little bit about the ways that you're newly addressing legacy in your role? Yeah, um, you know, I have a lot of ideas and lots of plans and I've written out, you know, the five-year plan and the 10-year plan. Um, but when I, what I keep going back to is, you know, I don't know what that actually means yet. Um, I know that Jose responded to the dancers in front of him. He responded to the world around him. So I know that that's what I need to do. Um, so my plan is to see what that actually means in real time. Um, when, we, when we looked at there's a time that you'll be seeing or that you just saw this evening, um, we looked at some of these roles that have always been performed by women, always performed by men. So in time to speak and time to be silent, it was always the man who was doing the clapping and the time to speak and the woman always being the time for silence. And it was like, well, maybe now is the moment that a woman needs to be speaking up and I have an Asian identifying woman doing the role and what more important moment than now to see something like that. Um, one of the final solos of the work is um, A Time for Peace, also traditionally done by a woman. So now I have an artist of, a male artist of color doing that because we need to see that being brought into the world now. We need to see ourselves represented on stage and we need to be leading by example and so that's where I'm coming from in terms of casting. I'm also looking at the dancers in front of me, like who is doing this work beautifully? Who is living inside of this vocabulary in this way, in this moment? Um, so I wanna highlight that as well in a way that we never really had the opportunity to do that. And of course there's gonna be backlash and controversy and you know, the OGs are like, you know, some of them are very against that. And I understand because it's hard to take something that has been something and been defined as something for so long but I just keep going back to the stories about Jose saying, or the stories about Jose where he's making the work on the people in front of him and he changed the solos and adapted. And I feel that this is the moment to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Carolyn, you all are using technology in a kind of way to bring the, the legacy of Trisha's work to kind of expand its impact and its um, access. Do you want to talk a little bit about the ways that you all are approaching Trisha's work through technology and the ways that Zoom has changed <laughs> and altered our lives kind of permanently? Sure. I mean, I think we also were on a tour and we've been working for a year together towards our 50th anniversary seasons. And um, the company was really uh, had a lot of momentum as a group and so to just sort of be like you know fly home and go into lockdown I think there was a strong desire to just keep um, continue some momentum together as a group even though we were dispersed all over um, the world actually and um, I think the younger generation they're really savvy with um, Zoom, Instagram, all these uh, social media um, delivery systems. And I think we were really fortunate. I mean, Trisha's work is uh, very process oriented, very, um, she's 
so, um, I mean, it's hard to say in one word, but I think that um, her early works, uh, they all have like these wonderful little rigorous um, structures, choreographic structures that we felt that we could share um, through Zoom and Instagram and just sort of like, um, to sort of give access to people to try these things like roof piece. Of course, we're not all on different roofs, but we have the material and we have the, um, we had something to share that people could actually try on their own. Yeah. And so it felt like um, at, in the beginning, I think it was just sort of trying to stay in touch with each other and offer, um, these systems for people to try and at home even. And so I think we just, her early works um, really lend themselves to that way of um, sharing. It's and it's kind of like, it's making me think, I, I don't understand uh, teenage technology, but it's making me think it's kind of like an original TikTok dance challenge <laughs> in a way because she, the score is there and it, the way that you all are sharing it outwards and inviting people into, yeah, just, I mean, she celebrated pedestrian movement and that's both a way in and is so much harder than <laughs> simply saying pedestrian movement, but that's, it's been a really exciting thing to watch the work um, evolve through more and new bodies. And I think we were trying to just really hone in on things where we could mine instructions that were very easily shareable. And I think it just brings a certain kind of lens into the work and the process that you might not get if you saw just a performance of solo olos, but to go home and try to be able to make your own spill or from the written instructions. They were just really, I think, very nice things to share. And it was, nice to start to receive um, uh, other videos. Like we were sent um, a few roof pieces from all over, you know, from Europe and it was just great. And yeah, like virtual, virtual roofs, you know, so it's pretty exciting. I think it's really hard to estimate um, what it's like to move together when you're afraid and isolated and you don't know what the hell's going on in the world. It's not, you know, obviously we can complain about what it's like to move in your living room and how frustrating it is and how it's not like being on stage. But I honestly feel like my sanity was preserved because we had something to do together in this square and in the series of squares. And it really was very helpful to me. And I, I'm, I, uh, I just want to let, I want to let people know that how important that was, even though it's not ideal. Yeah. Um, and just the the playfulness, I think, the um, the sense of like it is both sacred and alive, you know, the that idea of the the rep. Um, you have to breathe constantly new life into it with new bodies. So yeah, it's been really appreciated. Um, Stephen, oh, sorry, did Carolyn no, say no, more? It was also like a really beautiful platform for the dancers to have a creative voice also and the way that they were structuring things. Yeah. I, you know, um, yeah, so I was happy that, that that platform was open to that. And I think that we're gonna be able to develop further into the future because that, that opening is there and there's a lot of energy for it, so. Great. Um, Steven, you are the rare person in the room that is still a living choreographer with a company <laughs> legacy. So I, I want to just celebrate in this moment the way that you have been pretty um, radical in terms of your thinking about legacy, about succession planning, and about approaching both your company, your own sense of legacy, and what, uh, what you can give back to a field that you have been dedicated to for years. Um, 
it's it's been so inspiring to watch you and the company kind of grapple with both organizational structure, um, this residency center, the giving back. It's not just about your company creating work. It's about hosting other artists, creating collective space. And also the Bloodlines program has evolved from looking only to the past. And now you've been inviting a kind of uh, Bloodlines Forward initiative to in- Bloodlines Future. Bloodlines Future, yeah. thank you. Um, so just talk about what brought you to thinking, I mean, is it mortality? <laughs> what, you know, like where, where That's were it, you? Yes, baby. It's, it's all really, about it's, no. But it's really, it's kind of, um, it's so unique in the field to be grappling with legacy while you're still planning for the future of your company. So. Well, you know, those of you who know me know what a crazy control freak I am. And I, I realized at a certain point that um, so either someone was going to control my narrative or I was going to control my narrative. And uh, honestly, you know, also for those of you who don't know, I was the first male dancer in the Trisha Brown Company. So I've known Carolyn for a very long time. And we were talking earlier, one of my early modern dance training was the Lamone technique. So there's a nice connection here. But um, you know, I came into the I came into New York as an improviser in the 70s, and Merce Cunningham was already in his 50s, and I think Trisha Brown must have been in her late 30s or early 40s, and so these these were pillars in the world that um, that I had seen every day, and so Merce passed away, and then Trisha became gravely ill, and then finally passed away, and it, and I was hitting my 25th anniversary or my 30th anniversary, I can't remember which it was. Um, and it just really made me wonder what the hell I, I wanted with my life. And I had seen the way the Cunningham company was grappling with legacy. And of course, Lamone and, and Graham and, you know, kind of watching that as a, as a student of history. And, um, and then, you know, the intense pain of losing Trisha made me really question what I wanted from my life and what I wanted my legacy to be. So I started, I came out, of, I shot out of a cannon very early, toured the world, had some, you know, such great success. I just didn't think it was going to be about some dances that I left behind. And I, and I wanted, uh, you know, Trisha, uh, by the way, gave me, uh, she rented me the basement of 541 Broadway, which was the building that she lived in. I had 5,000 square feet for $100 a month for many years, wow. and that launched my career. And that general, and she, I don't even know if she liked my work, but she, she wanted to support me. And, um, and that kind of generosity surrounded her and the, the artists around her. And I, that's what I was raised on. And so um, I felt that uh, the thing that was most important in my life was being in the studio with people making things and not knowing what we were doing and then finding something. And I, I felt that that um, I wanted to honor those, those Judson artists through Bloodlines, but the residency center came about because that's what, in the end, if I can give that gift of creative process to the future generations, that's the biggest gift I can give. And so we founded the Petronio Residency Center. And uh, you know, it started off very selfishly. I, I want a place that I could rehearse. And then I realized that I was sitting on a whole revolution in my own life about the next generation. It's really, um, it's, it's so exciting. And personally, you getting the space is why I found my home. <laughs> you know, like I I heard that Lumberyard was moving up to the Catskill region. Then you announced that you were purchasing Crow's Nest and starting a resi center. And I was like, oh, I there will be people nearby. I can I can be part of a, a community. And, and look how much we've seen each other. <laughs> yeah. We see each other at the grocery store every six yeah. months, but that's it, you know. <laughs> you know, um, when I started this residency center, my company was like, you know, this is insane. It's hard enough to run a dance company to support you. How are we supposed to support this thing? And I was, you know, stubborn, stubborn, stubborn. Uh, much generosity from many visual artists and patrons. And, um, and um, when the pandemic hit, this harebrained idea became essential. And many artists sheltered here and, uh, and um, found the only time to breathe in a protected space was in a bubble residency like we could provide. And so uh, 
my uh, my hysteria about getting it done in 2017 might have been slightly psychic, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Dante, you were part of a very nearby, actually, um, bubble residency space that also has provided shelter for many artists at Kotzbahn. Yeah. Um, but I guess I taking what Steven said, I would love to hear about the ways that you're thinking about bringing um, commissioning work that responds to either Jose's own life or the ways that he was making work or the experience of being who he was in America at the time that he was creating yeah. uh, or yeah. what you're sort of thinking about in terms of that bloodlines future yeah um so we have two new commissions that we're working with this summer um actually we have a couple bubble residencies coming up um the first one is with an artist his name is olivier tapaga and i had met him a couple of years ago at university of florida and he was telling his he was telling his stories about growing up in Burkina faso and there were so many just like little details and i was like oh my gosh that's just like jose Boom, oh my gosh, that's just like Jose. And he just kept saying these things. I was like, wow, I'm like, this man grew up decades, continents apart, but the, the things that made him the artist that he is today mirror the things that made Jose Limon the artist that he was. I was like, well, how beautiful would it be to bring those two artists together to see what those works look like when, you know, in conversation with each other. So you have these two artists who had such similar upbringings and now their works can have this conversation and I think that is an important for me it's an important part to reveal who Jose was to people so it's not just this historical figure this man he created stuff but like who was he as a person what was he doing why was he doing it where did he come from that made him want to tell these stories so I thought by highlighting a, an artist making work now that has that similar story you know really brings out new color so when you look at the Limon work, you look at it through new lenses. Um, and then also we're working with a young artist. His name is Raul Tomez. He's in Mexico City. And so the idea of working with someone from where Jose was from, looking at some of the things that that artist is grappling with now is another way to get a deeper look into who Jose was and the tradition and what he left in his wake and what artists are doing in response to that. Uh, so that's another way I'm fleshing out these new ways of looking at the work um, and also celebrating other artists who are making really profound and influential work right now. That's fantastic. Um, for everyone to note, Dante is the sixth, only the sixth artistic director in 75 years. So um, no pressure, but this seems like a really, <laughs> yeah, really exciting path forward. Um, Carolyn, in similar ways, like, you know, you have this artistic leadership role and um, managing the licensing of the work throughout different ballet companies, modern repertory companies, expanding through these um, digital projects and kind of like sharing initiatives. But what what is most exciting to you about getting back to live performance on stage with Trisha's work? Uh, so much, but I mean, <laughs> just the, I mean, the work itself. Uh, yeah. I think Trisha's body of work is extraordinary. And um, I think uh, we have a, an amazing um, family of alumni to help with physical transmission. We have an amazing archive where every, pretty much every move Trisha's ever made is, is pretty well documented. So we can always um, hold ourselves to that, um, to that original creation and try our best to um, embody the spirit in the work. And, um, so the work itself, and also we just continue to build on alternative programming outdoors and museums to accompany the repertory work. And I think I'm, uh, this time period um, has opened some doors and I'm so excited about the work that we did on the Deep White Project. 
um, it was originally um, it, like the idea behind it began um, before COVID. We were supposed to, we had a licensing of glacial decoy to a company in Europe. And we really felt strongly that it was time to pass that um, torch to a younger generation. So um, Lisa, as Stephen has worked with her on the same transmission process, we passed it to our current dancers and they were supposed to fulfill this project. And we got started and halfway through the project with Lisa the licensing was canceled for the time period. But it felt so special to be together. And there was such a, um, I would say almost electricity around this work because it's been an incredible work. It's Trisha's first work for the proscenium stage. It was created after her solo water motor and her movement vocabulary is, is spectacular in it. And so I, I sort of think it was really interesting, I really, really wanted for the younger women to fulfill this idea of teaching it to um, teaching it, directing it. And so we thought we're going to share this with a larger group of women. And then there was the process of how are we going to create a form and uh, with, you know, and sort of wanting to be respectful of the iconic work within the archive, um, I had found things that I'd never seen before, rehearsals that I'd never seen. So it seemed like there was a beautiful time period between um, Trisha's um, early version of Glacial Decoy that wasn't complete and the completion of Glacial where she forayed off and created two different forms, one without the Rauschenberg set in costumes in a very narrow space and one for film. And it just felt like it was very nice to go into that specific time period where she was sort of going off on forays before completing the piece and, and sort of work with what she was working with at that time for this project. And it, I think it worked really beautiful for sharing um, you know, we had these beautiful women, four beautiful dancers join us. And so the form is constantly changing to uh, move through this cast of gorgeous dancers. And it felt right. So that was a kind of a fun experience to just say like, there's something, there's so much in the work that we have to work with and still be, I think, really respectful of Trisha's work and her idea. So. Glacial decoy, I, mean, yeah, I came into the company when, um, when Trisha had just finished Glacial decoy. And Trisha, you know, it's hard to say this, but I'm gonna say it. I think Trisha was dancing at the height of her powers when she made that work and she was in it. And watching her um, spew out that vocabulary and formalize it was one of the great lessons of my life. And uh, it's actually the first Trisha Brown work we took into Bloodlines because it moved me so much. And I begged, it's for four women. It's the last, it's the last work she did in silence and for, for all women. And I, of course, I begged her for the seven years that I was in the company to let me in. And she, of course, she, she gleefully wouldn't. <laughs> but, um, it's an amazing work. You should not miss it. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I think that we should probably wrap up just this is a perfect time to kind of encapsulate everything. I feel like I just want to say what I've heard from all of you in terms of legacy is both this sense of um, care, like this respect for this a field, a body of work that you're responsible for. So there's a responsibility, but there's also experimentation and there's a sense of um, playfulness in some ways, if you will, but there's also a generosity um, of, from each of you about giving, um, giving back, uh, giving forward and um, that legacy is a gift, I guess. Um, that each of you has approached in very different ways, but kind of reflecting, Stephen, the generosity that you received and the support from Trisha, 
I love, <laughs> I love that it doesn't matter if she liked your work or not. She cared about you as an artist, you know? Um, I, I just want to like hold on to that because it doesn't, that that's really heartwarming, you know? And I'm um, not saying she didn't like it, but I'm not confirming that, that she did. <laughs> no, 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 I know, but that, absolutely. But that, just that sense of, um, it, she, like she cared about you, you yeah. know, and the people that you care about is what you're doing moving forward. Like, and not knowing who you, who you, the center might care about beyond you, but it's just really beautiful. So I, I want to thank you all for joining. Um, I want to, um, we're, we're looking forward to these virtual seasons. Um, it is hard not to be in rooms with each of you and your beautiful companies and these wonderful dancers who embody the legacies of each of your artistic visions. And um, I miss you, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful that each of you has shared some aspect of what you're dealing with right now um, to con continue connecting with audiences that care about dance and care about the form. So um, thank you all for the work that you're doing to keep our field moving. I can't wait to see you in space. <laughs> I know, I know. We will dance again. Um, thank you all for joining us today and please, um, buy tickets, <laughs> see these wonderful works. Everyone is making experiments right now. <laughs> We've never done any of this before. So, <laughs> oh, look at that. This is wonderful. <laughs> Have a great day, you all. Um, wow. It's been a really wonderful conversation. And Dante, go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye.